Hello, colleagues. Today, we're going to talk about a couple of things. One, the progressive income tax structure and how it works. This is an interesting topic, and today is really about a building block in terms of concepts because it allows us in future episodes to think about things like Roth IRA conversions and more importantly, even our strategy for withdrawals in retirement where we're trying to manage both tax exempt instruments as well as taxable instruments. And to the extent we can control which one we're withdrawing from or supplement one with the other, this is a very, very important concept. So we'll take a quick look at the progressive tax structure just with no deductions, and then we'll take a look at it with um, standard, the standard uh, married filing joint deduction. And as always, um, the normal caveats apply both in terms of the limitations of this presentation itself, we're keeping things very simple and generic so that it's conceptual, as well as the limitations of your humble presenter. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and we'll take a quick look up here at the normal um, 2022 federal income tax brackets. And right now we're just talking about federal. We're not looking at state. We're not thinking about um, long-term capital gains, any of that kind of stuff, just the basics of tax brackets. And I imagine everyone is at least somewhat familiar with these. Um, this is 2022. There are tax rates. And today we're just going to look at married filing joint um, tax bracket ranges. So this is the basic table. And down below, we've taken that basic table and we just put it in a nice bar chart because this provides sort of an indication of the step up in tax rates that occurs as your adjusted gross income increases. And so um, with no deductions, the first $20,550 of your income is subject to a 10% tax. The next 60 some odd thousand is subject to a 12% tax. And this, this is really important. A very common and unfortunate misconception is that, you know, say someone has $21,000 of income, they'll say, I'm in the 12% bracket and mistakenly assume that all of their income is taxed at 12%. And it's simply not the case. And so this is, this is when drunk uncle goes off at Thanksgiving about how he's paying 12% or 22% tax, often they're referring to the tax bracket they're in rather than the amount of tax they actually pay. And so I put a couple examples up here just to illustrate this point. Suppose, suppose there's a, a married couple with um, $20,650 of income. How much tax do they pay? Well, the first $20,550 is taxed at 10%. So that's $2,055. And then they have an additional $100 that's in the 12% bracket. And so that costs them another $12 in taxes. So their total tax is 2067, right? And again, we look at the chart, they've got 20,550 at the 10% bracket, and then another $100 in the 12%. Likewise, a fairly substantial income of $100,000, we've got, you know, the first 2550 at 10%, another 60 some odd thousand at 12%, which totals 7,560. And then a little bit here, 17, $16,000 at 22%. So their total tax is $13,234 on AGI of 100K, which is, which is pretty big. They're in the 22% bracket, but if they were actually paying 22%, their tax bill would be 22,000, right? We might, we might ask ourselves, hmm, if I'm sitting here at 100K of income, I'm in the 22% bracket, what's my actual effective tax rate? Well, it's 13,000 divided by 100,000, about 13%, not 22%. Which, le which leads us to kind of an interesting question, yes? If, if, if 100K is in the 22% bracket, but doesn't really pay effective tax of 22%, how much do you have to be earning to actually pay 22% effective tax? effective rate. And we have a little chart here that depicts this. And this is truncated. So we're actually only, I'm sorry, this is the previous, the previous example where we have 100K. We're looking at just the 10%, 12%, and 22% brackets. So it's a bit truncated in terms of scale. But here's our 100K of income. They're in the 22% bracket paying 13.23%. So what do we have to earn in order to pay that 22% rate? Well, we'll just expand 
expand that bracket. And this chart goes from, from 1,000 all the way up to a million dollars of income. And this little green line shows for each of the gray tax brackets, how much effective tax one is actually paying. And so in order to get to, and forgive me, this, this is just round, not rounding a little bit, in order to get to an actual effective tax of 22%, you're earning $395,000 rounded for purposes of making this easy. So this person, or, or sorry, this, this couple is in the 32% bracket, maybe 34, I can't quite see, um, but they're actually earning 395 and paying 22%. I'm sorry, 22% effective. So on all 395K of income, they're paying 22%. So it's not, you're often paying far less than your bracket would suggest. And indeed, as we roll across this in income scale, these are pretty staggering levels of ordinary income. And even at a million dollars, hopefully this will, this will highlight for us, even at a million dollars of income, you're paying 30.45%, not 37%, which is the bracket you're in. So, so it, it's useful to understand this. And again, when drunk uncle is bellowing at Christmas, now you can sort of help explain how a progressive tax structure works. And if you're in the 22% bracket, it doesn't mean you're paying 22% on everything. Moreover, most of us get some deductions. And in this, in this overview, I'm only gonna discuss the standard deduction in 2022, and I'm only gonna look at the married filing joint deduction because that's the one that affects me and we don't have time to go through all of them, but the concept applies to all. So if I have a $25,900 standard deduction, that means the first 25, almost $26,000 is not taxed. And so here's the same bar chart we saw before. The only difference is now we've added in that first amount that's, that's eligible for the standard deduction. So the first almost 26K, there's $0 of federal ordinary income tax. Yes, yes, there might be state tax. Certainly there's gonna be payroll tax, you're paying sales tax, real estate tax, but conceptually, just talking about the federal side of things, the first 26K, you pay zero. Then once again, we just start layering on the same brackets you had before, the next, 20, what was it, $20,550 is taxed at 10%. But we see now though, the income, rather than being zero to 20,550 is 25,900 to 46,450. So if you are reporting this sort of income at 46,450, you're paying 10% income on this amount. And so just like before, when we look at how much tax somebody is paying, it's built up the same way. And we'll once again, take a look at that, bar, that, that long line chart because I think it's illuminating. Now we're back to our person who's earning $100,000. Now they're down actually in the 12% bracket. When we look at their effective actual tax, they're paying 8.48% of their income tax. I'm sorry, 8.48% 8, 8 effective rate on $100,000 of income looking at just the standard deduction. So not as much as, as drunk uncle might claim. And not, not surprisingly, in order to get to that 22% effective rate, this amount increased from 375 more or less up to 473,000. So somebody who says they're paying 22% tax, in this context, it means they're earning $473,000 of income, which is a pretty, a pretty substantial income compared to where most of middle, middle America sits. Now, why is this important? Well, one, as we've talked about is to, well, one is of course a basic understanding. All of us should grasp this. Two, we we'd want to think about um, when we're talking to drunk uncle to be able to explain how these progressive tax structures work. Progressive tax structures are not inherently a bad thing. And I'm not arguing for or against our tax structure as it stands but they're not inherently evil. Third, and here's the critical part for you personally, is when you're planning your IRA conversion, so say you have you know, a traditional IRA that you're thinking about converting, it's useful to understand where you stand in your tax brackets and how much space you might have before you bump up to the next tax bracket, because that determines how much tax you're going to pay. 
um, if you only go that high, or you might have a strategy to go even higher, you'd want to be able to predict how much tax you're actually going to pay on that. Secondly, downstream, when we're thinking about our withdrawal strategy, if you have tax deferred um, instruments, some, exec some exempt instruments, so say Roth IRAs or Roth 401ks, plus some ordinary income from pensions, from maybe a part-time job, or from social security to the extent that it's taxable, all those things play into this to build up where you sit in a tax bracket and allows you to think about, okay, how much should I take out of which type of account? Because you might choose to take some from your tax exempt accounts, some from your tax um, deferred accounts, and you wanna be able to plan in ahead, how do I manage taxes in a way that meets my strategy? Um, I'll real briefly just jump over into the structure. For those of you who are Excel geeks, this is sort of how I built it up. And again, many of you are far better at taxes than I am. Many of you are far better at Excel than I am. So for this simple example, I just built a basic table with rates, floors, and ceilings. I do a lookup against this floor using the match function. Um, once I get that, I can pull both the uh, tax rate as well as I calculate the um, total of the previous tax brackets and accumulate it. So for somebody in the 22% bracket, I look up the rate and I also sort of know where their floor is and how much they owe for the previous, for the previous bracket or two. And so when I do my lookups later, this provides me all the data I need to do those calculations. And as always, um, I usually wrap those in some sort of a named range um, or a named cell just for ease of reference. And so that as I'm using it later, um, I know what I'm looking at and helps me not make so many mistakes. Um, and as always, I do a little bit of testing to make sure that my results and my formulas are working. And especially, for example, we'd always want to look at around the bend points to make sure that uh, as we hit a bend point and move up a dollar or a hundred dollars, that our calculations are working correctly. And third thing I'll show you real briefly is just, I think the line charts are often very illuminating and sort of fun. So here's, here's where I did this. I just modeled in thousand dollar increments from a thousand to a million, um, the, the, the effective bracket for each of those total tax paid, um, calculated then the actual effective tax paid. And then we do a couple of lookups just because we're curious um, how, much, how much income do we need? I'm sorry, how much tax do we pay at 100K of AGI? And how much uh, AGI would we need to have in order to hit the 22% bracket? And that answers these questions we put up here. We start with an input for 100K, and then we do lookups to say, okay, what, if, what what's its bracket? Um, how much tax would they pay? And then the calculation of what's their actual effective tax. Likewise, we go backwards, we say, okay, to hit 22% hit effective tax rate, we essentially use this chart and we look up, although we could do it in the formula just as easily, right? We look up um, how much income is required, the, the bracket and how much tax that individual would actually pay in order to have that level of, um, that level of, of tax applied. Um, if I were a tax professional, rather than using the tables I used before, I'd probably just build a user-defined function where you'd pass it, say, you know, AGI, tax year, and probably um, filing status, pass those three things, and it would just pull back, you know, federal, federal um, tax. You could probably do another one for all the states, and then you wouldn't bother with tables at all. You just have a bunch of functions to do those sort of standard standard tax lookups. So that today, my friends, is a quick look at our progressive um, tax brackets, how they work, and how your tax actually um, is calculated, the uh, rates you actually pay. And again, this is a, a conceptual concept that we want to use for a future discussion on Roth IRA conversions and withdrawal strategies. So with that, I am going to end our recording as always, and I appreciate your time. Let's excel today, people.